And um, welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting. This is a special meeting to continue. keep pushing it down or um, there are a number of things that we can uh, talk about relative to that even if they're not here. Um, so we're going to start with um, summer programming update with um, Putnam who's um, been more than ready to do this for a while now. So Putnam the floor is yours. Okay um, so uh, my name is Putnam Kidder and I did the beach director position last summer and then um, have been the part-time recreation director um, over the course of this year, and then I'm doing the beaches again this summer. So I am presenting to you um, a basic outline of what's going on, what we hope to accomplish, um, and what it's going to cost um, approximately, and um, take any other questions or feedback about that. Um, so um, just to kind of put things into context that certainly last summer was um, a very different kind of summer coming out of COVID. Um, we were very last minute kind of about a lot of different things, um, trying to get staff, trying to um, figure out how we were gonna handle various opening procedures, access proce procedures. Um, so this summer, I think we'll be, we'll still be feeling some effects of that, obviously, but um, a little step more towards normal. Um, clearly, um, we're still like the rest of the world struggling to find good quality help at um, prices that make sense. So, um, but that is kind of the landscape we're working in a little bit. Um, so I have a big packet that I can go through um, item by item, if that's what the selectman would like. Um, and if they want, they can stop me at any point um, to ask questions or clarifying um, comments or feedback. And if um, need to be moved along, please move me along. Um, so we have several programs that we're going to offer this summer. One is the paddleboard and kayak loan out program, which is going to happen at both beaches. Um, we have beach attendants, they will continue to loan out kayaks and paddle boards. We have a waiver, um, which is uh, part of the packet that we developed last summer um, for users to sign rules they'll be expected to follow. It is a very popular program. And while it is not common for towns um, in the Northeast to offer this kind of program, um, it is a service that I feel it is worth continuing that people really enjoy and appreciate. Um, and I did consult with several towns, Meredith, Moultonboro, um, Sunapee, and there are very few towns that do a program like this. Um, there is um, a program similar to it in Gorham, Maine that I'm trying to connect with um, their recreation department about how they do it, but um, it is different, but I think there is value to it, and we really strive to do it in a safe way to make sure that the staff members who are loaning out these uh, this equipment know the procedures to, to do it safely, to make sure all they have all the safety equipment, and also that um, they're following through and um, our waivers and our uh, paperwork is all done correctly. And that was reviewed last year. Um, we had it do um, Primax had looked at that and also um, some of our the town lawyers have given it a once over as well. Um, so that is something that is really unique to our town, but I think people really, really appreciate and that I think we can offer it with the right training um, safely and effectively. Um, and it is certainly a benefit and a way for people to get out and appreciate our wonderful lakes in the summertime. We are going to plan to offer swim lessons. They haven't happened for the last couple of years. We um, hope to consolidate it into July um, for ages five to 11 um, and just do them over the course of July. I will be um, advertising those or promoting those on our website 
and having signups for those over our um, online recreation desk software very soon. And we hope to do them at both beaches. And um, we have lifeguards that are, are gonna get trained to do these lessons through the um, either Red Cross or another program. And there's a lot of interest in getting those back um, in. I've had lots of people come up to me and say, hey, are we gonna have those? It's a really important service that people have been missing out on. Um, so we're gonna do those. And I'm going to say, you know, we'll just people can sign up and um, we'll offer as many classes as we can over the course of July during those, they'll be just one week sessions. Um, but I think people are really excited about that. And it's an important thing for um, people to be able to utilize the beaches safely. Um, so sailing lessons, we will, like last year, we're not going to be offering those. Um, that was an extra cost when costs are already um, on the rise. And, um, and we didn't offer swim lessons last year. So that is a definitely a, an additional expense. So um, we also really want to, when I came on, I wasn't um, so confident around the safety protocol of the ability for um, our lifeguards to be able to access someone who might be out on a boat um, on as part of a lesson or borrowing the boats on uh, Little Lake Sunapee. So we're looking into that. So right now, unfortunately, the sailing lessons have kind of been um, put to the back burner to be um, just looked at. Hopefully, maybe we can bring them back, but if we have to get the right staffing, we have to be able to do it safely. Um, and that we want to, again, like the swim lessons, there's certainly um, a, a lot of interest in people wanting those to come back. And so we were hoping that maybe we could find some local um, people with some sailing skills that could um, maybe we could have one day clinics down at the beach beach over the course of the summer, um, because we do have um, a number of boats that the town has that we would like to be able to use. But again, it's a um, staffing thing. It's a budget thing. And it's also um, a safety thing that as of now, um, we're going to put sailing lessons kind of off of our programs this year. Um, we are interested in trying to maybe do a little swim lane um, to the left of the swim area at Elkins to try to talk to, there is the uh, Upper Valley Aquatic Center. They do swim team out of Hogan. And that's something we're um, collaborating with um, to think about maybe try to do some outdoor swimming um, for adults or younger people. And um, swimming is very uh, getting more and more popular. And there's, it's really fun to do in a pool at a race, but it's also really fun to be able to do it outside. Um, so that's something I'm looking into. I'm also looking into the ability to um, get some younger youth around the area who might be interested in kind of doing like a little junior lifeguard, junior beach attendant program that I would supervise to try to get younger kids in the area seeing how the lifeguards do their job, seeing how the attendants do their job, um, and being able to say, wow, maybe this is a job I would like to have moving down, um, you know, years from now. So, um, and just get little kids learning about being safe on the water. Um, so that's another possible program. I'm looking at um, having the Crescent Moon Yoga Studio at Elkins, um, use Elkins for um, some of their morning classes, and that would be just kind of a periodic uh, event they would have down there on the grass in the morning, and that wouldn't in impact any of the, uh, it would be before the beach is open, and also um, it wouldn't take up very many spaces. So that would be just another, or parking spaces, it would be another way to just offer something different down there um, that I think there's definitely an interest in doing. Any questions, comments so far? We will, we will be opening it up. It'll be regional, I would say, and anyone can. It's always been, um, as far as I know, it hasn't just been for New London residents. What's that? Oh, I, th I think then I guess in the last few years, it is, has been the broader, you know, and over sur surrounding towns. So 
Um, yes, that would be a, a little bit of a problem, but I think maybe we could talk to the police and say for those events, they would maybe not be having people get ticketed or we have, we do have little passes. I know they've done that in the past. They will say, I'm here for the swim lessons. And then that'll be, they'll have a little parking pass. So, um, actually, yes, John. Lane, you're talking about, uh, is that going to be in the field that's down there? Nope. So the, the, the mooring field is a very unique, interesting situation we've been learning a lot about. But our hope would be to that it would not interfere with the mooring field. And if it did interfere with the mooring field, there some of those moorings could be moved out. Because I've been told um, it's a unique situation down there for sure. And we and, and we know about that. And um, we we we're talking to people and we've talked, been learning a lot about that whole situation. So Putnam, um, perhaps you could talk about what the current status of the staffing of this. Yes. And then also what your budget yep. is going to be looking like. Yeah, so staffing, um, we have lifeguards who are mainly just focused on watching the water, doing safety around that. If they had to do rescues, they would be doing that. They would be performing all water safety um, protocol. And um, ideally, there are two chairs at each beach, so they're on for a half an hour and then they're off for a half an hour. So we would have four guards at each beach. Um, right now, we would like to have them there from 10 to 6 p.m. Um, and right now, we would like to have them be um, there Memorial Day weekend and just weekends until school gets out and school gets out on the um, 21st or the, yeah, the 21st. So then we would be seven days a week, hopefully, as of then, um, once school was out. So we have a range of 14 to $18 an hour based on experience and what we offered last year. Last year, again, I think was a really unique situation that we kind of had to make it um, appealing to them to come work um, and that we were really trying. It was impossible to find workers anywhere, really. So that was a really unique situation. So that I think puts us a little bit higher than um, maybe in the past. So as of now, we have 10 guards who are returning um, and many of them either were attendants last year or guards um, last year for us. So that I feel like we have a pretty good group. I think we would like more ideally, but um, that's what we have right now. And the beach attendants are the people who are in charge of cleaning up the beach, interacting with staff, um, or with guests and um, also doing the boat, kayak and paddleboard rentals. And also if there ever was an emergency, they would be facilitating um, the lifeguards with a phone call to um, the ambulances and things like that. So as of now, um, we have seven attendants and they tend to be younger than the lifeguards and that that would be a rate of $12 an hour. And depending on numbers of visitors, we would have them there at the same time from 10 to 6 p.m. And we could do, ideally there would be two of them, but on slower days, we could probably just have one. So for the swim instructors, we're gonna have them be $14 an hour just for the month of July. It really is going to depend on how many people we get to sign up um, as to how many classes we offer. But the thought would be that we would try to get them in there and not impact the open times of the beaches. So have the, the lessons be from nine to 11, each one hour sections, um, Monday through Friday. And ideally we would have guards who weren't working those days would come in and be trained as um, swim instructors. So the budget projections, um, to an I estimated very, very high, thinking about kind of the highest number as what we do, that these are projections that can go up or down depending on weather. When it's really, really bad weather, we don't open the beaches. If it's a total washout, if it's you know 55 degrees and pouring rain all day, we will not open the beaches. We close the beaches when um, there's thunder and lightning. 
So um, I can't factor into how many days we might be open or we might not, whether it's gonna be a hot summer or not. Um, so it depends on the weather, the number of visitors, participants and lessons because the lessons we are, are going to be charging money for. So that will be bringing in some money. Um, so I wanna offer competitive wages for quality staff while working to stay within the budget and use those funds in a responsible and transparent manner. Um, the numbers are not definite and will change it is, is it impossible to predict the weather, staff availability, interest in swim lessons and a myriad of other factors. So I'm saying that I'm open to any and all questions and feedback. So if we had a range of guards at 14 to $18 um, for the summer, which is about 12 weeks, give or take, um, we would be looking if there were four guards there for that time, we would be looking at $86,000. Um, that number is an estimate and could be significantly re reduced if we chose, if there's weather impacts, but also if we chose to not offer lifeguards for seven days a week. If we cut off a day, obviously that number is going to go down, but I wanted to give up a, a number that is going to reflect kind of what it could be. That doesn't mean that's what it's going to be. There are a lot of factors involved in that. The instructors would be $14 an hour. And um, depending on if we had one class or two class, it could range from $700 to $1,260, $1,260, depending on how many kids we have involved enrolled in the class. Um, we will be taking money in for that. We will be charging a fee. And we're looking at about um, $80 for the five to 11 year olds and then $50 for the younger kids, three to five year olds. So um, thanks Putnam. So maybe you could do the budget overview in terms of yeah. based on that, what you think your cost projection will be Yep. and where you'll fall out relative to this. Mm -hmm. So the cost for the summer at the highest range would be um, approximately 112,712. So we have $18,000 remaining, and then that is would take us through June 30th. And then um, we have in the budget for 2022-2023 um, of $60,000, so which can be utilized as of July 1st. Um, and so obviously that would leave us a little bit over budget. This would give us 34,000 that we would need to um, meet the projected figures. So, it puts us over, but I can't say that how many rainy days we're gonna have. Um, I can't project. Also, we can certainly cut those numbers down by having the beaches not open seven days a week. Um, so that's an approximate overview I have. And we also have expenditures. Um, one thing that we do is the, um, reimbursement for kids so they can get reimbursed um, for their training if they tr get certified to be lifeguards. So we give them money um, as an incentive for that. So you've not factored those other expenditures into your overall budget at this point. Is that correct? Um, those are, those are, I don't know how many kids, it's a case to case basis. So yeah. I don't know how many kids are going to want the reimbursement yeah. or yep. I guess get a lifeguard suit. Yep, yep, that we, we give them an opportunity. We'll give them $20 to get a guard suit. Okay. Um, any questions? Go ahead. So, Putnam, you've obviously uh, alluded to this already. You're potentially, if everything went extremely well in terms of weather and so on, have a pretty significant budget deficit at this point which I assume you, you understand would have to probably come out of the uh, other activity fee money that's there because mm -hmm. you unfortunately are the first of, um, I assume a parade of issues we're going to have in the coming year for um, inflationary um, expenditure. So mm -hmm. you know, I just would urge you to know right from the beginning to have a very sharp pencil and keep us and the Recreation Commission uh, well of, advised as to what's what's going on obviously can't make any decisions now who knows what the weather is going to be mm -hmm. or the attendance at the beach for that matter but thank you for your good hard work here hmm. 
Any other questions or any final statement, Putnam, that you'd like to make? Um, I just would say that we have um, a wonderful resource in our beaches and our recreation program. And um, I'm really excited to get people out and using them. And I am in full support for um, comments from the public. If, if they wanna have any questions of me anytime, um, my information is on the website and um, I, I wanna use the money we have responsibly and transparently and respectfully and um, but also put on good safe um, well run programs. Good. Thank you. Pana. Okay, um, next we have the schedule for the ARPA funds project review. Kim. Right. Um, we have not the selectmen have not decided uh, where they will put uh, the 400 plus thousand dollars in opera funds that we have. So I would recommend that we set up a schedule starting perhaps with the June 9th meeting where we invite in the water precinct and Bob Harrington for sewer projects and any other projects he might have and any other projects that members of the public might want to recommend for use of those funds. So that in the next four to six weeks, you can make those decisions while we have time um, to enter into these contracts and spend the money. What I'm hearing from other towns is there's so much of this federal money out there that the engineers are really getting booked up. Um, and so we will wanna make sure for those projects that need engineering, that we make commitments as soon as we can. Kim, can you just outline what the parameters are around the use of those funds? Um, the early um, announcements from the feds were that it could be used only for broadband for water and sewer projects, but that has expanded now to things that address public health emergency. I know towns that are buying police cars. Um, I think we could look into some improvements for Whipple because the uh, improvements for Whipple will facilitate group meetings uh, during a pandemic, emergency, um, things that would relate to an emergency um, could be considered by the town. So um, while I think that water and sewer, obviously those are big ticket items, um, and do promote health. I mean, that was the, that was the original uh, goal of these funds to increase um, the, the healthy infrastructure of town. So but I think we do now have a little bit more leeway and we can get a little bit more creative um, in our projects. So American Rescue, rescue rec uh, no, Recovery. Let's see, our American Recovery. I don't remember. We use ARPA so much. Let's see. Yeah, good question. I'll put it on on the web. See who can Google it first and yeah. you win a prize. Okay. Right. It's more than $400,000. And, you know, it's, it, I think it's a great opportunity for the town of New London to do some projects that, you know, I, I think we can all come up, easily come up with more than 400000 on any one project. Um, America, go ahead, America, shout it up. America Rescue Plan Act. Rescuing, excellent. Lynn wins. Yeah. Not recovery. We're going to use it kind okay. of like recovery, Thank but you. It's rescue. Okay, next item up, um, Rob Prohl, uh, I believe you're here for the Conservation Commission grant application for the yes. Philbrook Crescenti Bog Walkway. Yes. Thank you. Some of you may have uh, seen that uh, the <clears throat> Conservation Commission is uh, looking at replacing sections of, of the uh, boardwalk. Uh, wow. in the bog and doing me, and Rob, loop. Rob, here, up here. <laughs> Could Where? you come out from behind the pole so, oh, and so can you can see, see me? <laughs> Thanks. To uh, replace sections of the uh, wooden boardwalk with an aluminum walkway. I think the, the uh, board also approved earlier uh, $50,000 from the Mary Haddad Fund. Uh, I have written a grant on behalf of the uh, uh, Conservation Commission using the uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund for $50,000, which would then match with the other funds to uh, use towards this project. I also learned after I had submitted the grant that this project was in fact, this fund uh, funded the original purchase in the 1970s uh, of the uh, uh, bog and also some of the uh, original 
walkways. There were there were two projects at that time. So I got to go to the archives and kind of read about the history of how Jim Cleveland was certain that he could get Washington to give us the money. And and it was a, it was kind of an interesting read. So we need to have a vote by the board that authorizes the uh, Conservation Commission to uh, if we get the grant to accept the grant. There's a preliminary round where they where where they will be coming out on June 1st to actually walk through the bog with me and Bob Brown to make sure that uh, this project is in fact a viable project. They did tell me that um, just because we got funds in, in the past doesn't mean that we can't get funds now because there's a different purpose. So with that, I, I would hope that you would uh, uh, have a motion to uh, to approve this application for fifty thousand dollars for the uh, Chris Any Bog aluminum walkway project. Any any uh, questions at all? Are there any questions either from the board or the oh, okay, Janet? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Rob. I want to thank you for taking the time to look for the grant and apply on behalf of the town of New London. I think this will be a great project. Um, I don't see Chief Cobb here, so we're going to um, hold off on the police department grant agreement. Um, so the next one is we need to select the September primary voting site for posting of notice to voters. Kim? Or turn it over to Will? Or Will, yes? We would like to request to use Whipple Hall again for September. For voting? For voting, yeah. OK. That's a proposal. Do we need? So now we'll need a motion if the selectmen agree, because this is a, um, a po posting that we must do to announce where this location is. So all voters know well in advance where you're going to vote in September. I move that we uh, hold the September primary elections at Whipple Hall. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. There we are. OK. Um, so. We have one other matter. Um, Selectman Helm, do you want to bring up relative to the budget committee meeting? Sure. Um, the budget committee, is, night? As, as you probably know, meets tomorrow night. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the agenda items is to begin to set a schedule for uh, budget committee meetings for the rest of the, the year. I think prelim, prelim, uh, the preliminary budget committee meeting uh, a month ago, there was some sense that there ought to be more meetings of the budget committee with department heads than simply the couple of meetings that they have at the end, plus the ones they have with us. So my question for Nancy, for you and Janet is, what instructions do you wanna give me in terms of our pleasure about having meetings uh, about the budget with the uh, budget committee, or do we want to simply uh, let them have their meetings and we'll have our meetings and then we'll reconcile at the end? Well, personally, in the past, I think it has been helpful and informative to have the two committees meet together um, and go through the process um, so that um, that limited the impact, uh, hopefully, on town employees in terms of doing presentations to two different groups several different times and so forth and being repetitive. Um, that's my suggestion. Um, I guess my question would be for Kim. Do you feel that that was the case that um, the number of meetings were um, fewer and the department heads were not having to go to multiple meetings to repeat the same thing, to hear the same thing and repeat the same thing? I don't think the meetings were fewer. I think department heads go to both the selectmen and to the budget committee. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having the budget committee hear the first presentation to the selectmen is a good thing. They will go to the budget committee meetings that second time around. Um, and I think by that time, sometimes things have changed and sometimes budget committee members think up new questions and sometimes department heads, new information has come to them too. So I, I don't see it really as saving meetings, but I do see it as more information 
going to both the selectmen and budget committee. Okay, thank you. Okay, so where does that leave us? We have joint meetings. Okay. Thank you. We should also at some point, although I'm not prepared this evening to discuss um, how we want to approach the budget uh, process for the next cycle, since we're going to have many challenges, and also how we're going to, um, with Lynn, look at um, third quarter and fourth quarters um, as to where we are with um, revenues and expenses, because um, I know that with the price of gas going up and other kinds of things, it is going to have an impact on our budget. So sure. we need to, um, I think, give direction relative to what our expectations are for the town um, departments relative to keeping their budgets in check and so forth and give them a, um, a goal. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Will. All right, um, then the next item is to uh, continue the discussion of governance initiatives um, that were um, originally proposed by Selectman Helm. Um, and I don't know if you want to lead off. I believe you've. Sure. Might as well continue, continue that. I want to thank everybody for the input they've continued um, to provide. Um, that's all part of the process to get get information and I think you'll see in some of my comments this evening as the time goes on uh, there's been I've um, I've heard some of those and I think some of uh, both Nancy and Janet have um, also and I think that you know the listening and uh, understanding and the giving and take that are necessary for leaders of a body like like the uh, different persuasions but of, of a town governance body um, is, is really important so I'm hoping that uh, I will be demonstrating my willingness to give and take a bit with the where I would like to see us head tonight, if that's all right, Nancy. So um, in terms of the five proposals I made originally, I'm going to suggest um, for the purposes of discussion or um, whatever people would like to do that the proposals related to the uh, selectmen and the budget committee memberships and the responsibility for the um, CIP all be set aside, I think we should be able to expect in the light of the recent discussions, everyone has gained some real clarity on the importance of independence, which was a primary theme for those proposals. And if we feel there's some specific problem with somebody or some group of people re re related to independence from the selectmen or the budget committee, we can deal with that on an individual basis. So I don't know, would you like to stop there, Nancy, and talk about that or just let me go through? I'd like to see if there's any reaction to that john hang on just for a second he's will's coming with them bill could you explain what a governance initiative is well i think you know my, my definition john was to set forth several ideas that might uh, improve as i said the first night the independence in the case of some of these proposals and in other cases, the uh, effectiveness of the way we govern. So uh, primarily effectiveness. And how would they be effected? How, how are they made rules, laws, or, or how do you make things happen like that? Well, I think what we, what we do is as a board, we decide whether we want to adopt some of the suggestions I made. So for example, I proposed that we um, uh, once again review what the CIP uh, process looks like, um, because I thought I personally believe it would be more effective if that was done differently than the way it's done today. But having listened to discussion around the room over, I guess, three nights now, or and a lot of written correspondence, my conclusion is that that's probably not something we want to take on at this point. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thelma. Sorry, Will. Are you asking for? You're getting your Fitbit. <laughs> so Bill has revised his original proposal and has proposed something different. So at this point, we're asking people's response to his revised proposal. Well, since I don't know what the revised proposals are, Bill. 
I can't address that. I can only address what I know. Well, Thelma, what, what, what I have is several proposals and um, I've started and said, the first one is that my proposal regarding selectmen not being on other committees, my proposal regarding budget committee members not being on other committees, and my proposal that CIP be handled differently, I'm suggesting all three of those be set aside. So that's the first item. And uh, I think in discussions before the meeting started tonight, uh, I said, Nancy and I agree that I'd sort of take these in, in one bite at a time. I've got several more proposals left to go, but I think she's asking now whether or not you, the audience has, has any comments on that first proposal, revised proposal of mine, which is to not further the discussion on those three items. So he's taking those three items off the table. That's all right. Okay. okay. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Thank you for the clarification. Was there some other revision bill that you wanted to share or? Not regarding those three. Okay. Any comment from? Okay. Um, hearing no comment, I'm going to take uh, the chair's prerogative and um, make a comment. So the objective of uh, town governance, if you will, or uh, working with a town is to engage people, the citizenry to have uh, broad stakeholder input um, and to attain consensus building. Um, to me, those are the most important properties of working in a town. Um, I called for the creation of the Building and Facilities Committee um, originally last session um, of the three years. Um, because it came out of several discussions around uh, having a full-time facilities manager or not. Uh, the compromise that we struck was to create the Building and Facilities Committee um, that would address many of the outstanding matters relating to buildings in town, space, and storage. Um, they drafted a charter. We had uh, very talented experienced, knowledgeable individuals who have served on that committee and have served as well. Concerns I've heard expressed by, by colleagues warranting the dissolving of the Building and Facility Committee. Um, one is that the Building and Facilities Committee's responsibility is too overarching. I have to say that without doing any extensive research, I conducted a quick and simple Google search and brought up no less than seven towns immediately that have building and facilities committees. The towns of Bow, Belmont, Lyme, Enfield, Jackson, Exeter, and I know there are many others. There are reasons they're instituted, not dissimilar to ours as I pulled up the charters of what it is that they have been asked to do by the Board of Selectmen. I've also heard that building facilities took too much of staff's time. Throughout that time, no complaint was made to the Board of Selectmen from staff, either directly or through the town administrator. I have found that um, there was also a statement that there was not providing efficient and timely input to selectmen. Um, and that was a reason for dissolving them. And a concern um, around the overall structure um, that it was not effective in how it did its work because it operated through a subcommittee and then went back to the full committee and so forth. To me, both of those items could be addressed by communication and dialogue between the Board of Selectmen and those committees as to what is of concern as to how they're functioning or not functioning. Their process matters and in warrants good communication, setting those expectations. So in the spirit of being a family friendly discussion, why would we not consider a compromise? Rather than dissolving a current working committee, why not follow, follow the suggestions that actually were made by one of the members who unfortunately could not be here tonight because he's ill. And that's Phil Sherman. 
The first of which is to rework the Building and Facility Committee Charter to alleviate any concerns with the scope and focus of the Building and Facilities Committee. And this should come from us, the Board of Selectmen. Two, open up and consider clear lines of demarcation between the Building and Facilities Committee and the Capital Improvement Plan. Perhaps the BFC should provide the requested technical advice and the project management were requested while the CIP in whatever form it takes provides advice on whether a given item should be pursued and what priority. There are ways to have give and take here. Number three, requests for building and facility committee analysis should be specific with agreed upon deadlines, whether ongoing or project specific tasks. Consider whether they should be written or verbal, but that should be clearly set with the um, Board of Selectmen. Consider terms of membership of the BFC that align with the Selectmen during an election schedule to allow new members of the Board of Selectmen to have an immediate say on who is providing advice to the Board of Selectmen. And then the fifth um, recommendation that he made was understanding the impact of all of this will take time and reasonable consideration. And therefore, he suggested the proposal to abolish the BFC to also be set aside for the time. I think this is a sound and practical compromise. Because you have a committee and you don't like the way they have worked, well, shame on us. We've not done our job as the Board of Selectmen to give clear expectations. Simply dissolving them and asking them to go away after they have spent so much time and energy on behalf of the town of New London, I think is a disservice. I think it also sets a very bad precedent for establishing an expectation that we want to invite people to volunteer and to serve with their time and talents, the town of New London. So again, shame on us if we have not done our job as the Board of Selectmen. So I would suggest that we work with our volunteers rather than against them as we move these projects forward. Together, we can make the town of New London a better place and get our projects done. But we'll do much more with creating consensus than continuing to promote division. So again, I call for a compromise rather than the continuation of suggesting that there be a dissolution. This is a town government. This is not a board of trustees. This is not a board of directors. You can't simply dictate to individuals what you want to be done as though they were staff members. We are volunteers, all of us. We all have to learn to work together. So those are my comments. Do you want me to continue? Yeah. You may continue. Thank you. So that uh, I was <clears throat> not aware that Nancy was going to make that those comments before I even got to finish my comments. So I'm just going to continue on that path and then try to weave this um, back to back together. Um, so I'm going to actually I'm going to I'm, Nancy I'm going to continue in the order in which I. Was, was going to speak and I'll come back to the Building and Facilities Committee in a few minutes. Um, my, my first proposal that I'd like us to act on tonight is to actually dissolve the current Solid Waste Management Committee as a permanent committee and establish a new ad hoc group to advise the Board of Selectmen over the next six months on several uh, waste issues, including ones related to the transfer station. I would suggest asking John Monaris and Jerry Gold from the um, old Solid Waste Committee, uh, Peter Hoagland, who's been working on the transfer station issues um, for the BFC, and Maureen Prohl, who has been leading with the citizens community and in other forums uh, issues related to, to um, uh, waste matters that they constitute this group and begin to work with the selectmen as soon as possible to frame the work task. Alternatively, of course, we could retain the existing committee and assign and 
reconstitute the people on it and assign this task to them. But I feel very strongly that what we want to do is to have a series of ad hoc committees, advisory boards, whatever one wants to call them, who take on these specific tasks in a time ending matter. I think that um, for these types of projects, including the ones that the Building and Facilities Committee has been working on, it's important to have a beginning and an end and not just continue on, on and on. So in the case of the Solid Waste Management Committee, I think they did a good job up through uh, 2017, 2018, but it's sort of just languished since then. Uh, and I would prefer to see us at this point say, there's a task to be done right now, which is to identify how this town is going to deal with its a variety of solid waste issues from composting to uh, traffic at the transfer station to uh, uh, additional land behind the um, um, public works garage that might be acquired to help with the um, solid waste issues like trash and um, uh, paper goods and plastic and that sort of thing. So I am going to continue to believe that that dissolving the current committee whose purpose seems to have passed and setting up instead one of these uh, ad hoc groups is the right way to go. And I'm going to, as you might imagine, when we get to the Building and Facilities Committee, again, make an argument why ad hoc groups with specific tasks and, and time deadlines are more appropriate than um, committees that just go on and on. Because in fact, in order to attract volunteers who want to work on projects, we ought to have small time limited projects where people with the right uh, uh, skills for those, and interest for those particular projects can be uh, come in and go rather than having a committee that has members that uh, continue for one, two, three or six years or whatever. So my first proposal is I move that we dissolve the current solid waste management committee as a permanent committee and establish a new ad hoc group to advise the Board of Selectmen over the next six months on waste management issues, including ones related to the transfer station. Um, I'll second that and then I have a question for you, Bill. Sure. Have you asked um, these people if they're interested in serving on an ad hoc committee? No, I have not. I only mentioned them to give, the, uh, give us a flavor of the types of people who we might include that would be a cross section of people who have been interested in waste man management issues from different point points of view. I mean, obviously, there's no sense in asking them if they want to do it if we haven't agreed that there's going to be a, a need for such a body. Okay, thank you. But, I, but these four people are all ones who, by my recognition, have been involved in various types of waste management transfer station issues over the last couple of years. Okay. So there's a motion and there's a second. I'll open the discussion to the public. It's okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I can appreciate having an ad hoc and wanting to do something so that a project gets completed. I think we'd all love to do that in our, our work and our personal lives to see things have a start and an end date, but solid waste, is is not going away it's 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 not static it's it's something that we're going to have to deal with forever and ever and i i don't see these I, I don't see the benefit of getting rid of a full committee and doing something ad hoc on a short-term basis because these these are issues that we have to deal with forever as humans we create a lot of waste and we only have one earth and um you know we really need to deal with it on a long-term basis and if people don't want to serve three years, maybe they want to serve one year. Um, I, I'm, I can see where it needs some revitalizing the committee if it, it's, if it hasn't been doing much since 2020, perhaps you know, spend the next six months um, working to revitalize it and communicate with it and, and define you know, what, what needs to be done. But these issues are not short-term, they're not going away. We, we're gonna to need to leave, live with these issues for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Uh, may I respond to Casey, please? Uh, yes. Casey, I understand that uh, uh, trash and so on are uh, solid waste issues, are life, lifetime issues. 
what I want us to do as a town is to focus on a short period of time here on how we're going to begin to deal with it, not to have an extended sort of perpetual discussion about, about it. There are only so many things we can do in terms of we're going to decide whether we're going to compost or not compost. We're going to decide whether we're going to make some changes at the transfer station. We're going to decide um, whether or not we want to uh, acquire more property, uh, both at the transfer station and behind the public works garage. We're going to decide, we need to decide how we're going to handle the uh, possibility that we will have landfill issues in the future. But we need to address those issues in a timely fashion and, and work on them hard and then get on, on with it. Uh, everything that we do around here, we could say, needs a committee to, to be perpetually working on it. But there are some things that need to have attention paid to them in a short period of time with a focus on it with a group of people that really want to work on those issues, not having a committee with turnover and so on, but a small group of people that lead us through a very, very important set of discussions. Rob? Uh, I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for my wife, believe me. Uh, but one of the things that uh, folks had mentioned at the previous meeting was having a committee that would come and report to the select board, get further direction, get further focus, and, and be come back on a regular basis. I mean, I think part of the problem has been, I mean, you, you, there just hasn't been that focus and that reporting back to get more directions. Uh, and whether that's a standing committee that's, that's there and, and does its work with the uh, select board or whether it's a focus group, I think, I think the key is the communication. And if a committee isn't working right, then the selectmen need to address that issue when the chairman or whoever it is comes before the committee and the chairman's not doing his or her job, well, then they need to get a new chairman. I mean, it, you know, we need to keep focused. And uh, I think it can work either way is what I'm trying to say. The key thing is the communication and working with the select board. And, and Rob, the, at the last meeting, Nancy made, made the point several times that we need to have a regular schedule of speaking and working with the, with the various committees, whatever their form is. So thank you for that. Bob. Uh, Bob Bowers, I'm a resident here. <clears throat> I, I second what Bob's saying. I think you need to give serious consideration structurally to how these kinds of things work because someone who is dedicated to solid waste management questions and concerns is going to be paying attention to what that, how that develops throughout this area and what those needs might be. Where the selectmen are currently meeting every two weeks, they have a full schedule. They are not going to be devoted to determining whether composting is, a, is an issue that needs to be addressed in an ad hoc manner. Uh, whereas a committee, if it meets with the selectmen on a regular three month basis or whatever you determine, can raise questions, selectmen can raise questions with them, they can determine whether there's an ad hoc issue that ought to be more specifically addressed. But they can come back to the selectmen saying, here's something you have not thought about at your meetings, here is something we think is important. This would be similar to the energy committee, which has not shown up in any of these discussions. They are focused on energy issues. Uh, I would turn to them before I would turn to the selectmen if I wanted to know what was an energy problem and how to address it. And I think you need a dedicated body, and the key, as Rob points out, a dedicated body uh, that is aware of these issues and can bring them to the selectmen rather than selectmen having to be aware of everything and every issue on every facet of life and then find a way to appoint two or three people to take a look at one thing. So I would urge you to strongly uh, consider not disbanding that committee, but rather beginning to restructure it, have meetings with them, find people who are interested, what those issues are, and then work with them to identify those ad hoc issues that need to be addressed and ask them to them go forward. So thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay, I'll make a comment relative to this proposal. Um, it's been my experience that as any group life, um, it has fits and starts, um, and that what is being proposed, having ad hoc, short-term, time-limited groups, um, can work well in a nonprofit arena, 
from a board of directors, because typically you have a staff person who is assigned to that ad hoc group who continues the theme and can follow through on that. Volunteers work, have other lives. We ask so much of them to be volunteers. Without a group that is tethered to them, and again, ongoing communication and direction from the Board of Selectmen being critical, I disagree that uh, to go to an ad hoc advisory committee um, is not the right thing to do. Um, so I will call the vote um, unless there is any further discussion. And I'll ask for a roll call. So Janet? Yes. Bill? Yes. Nancy? No. OK. Do you want me to continue? I would say so. OK. So now, now turning ourselves to the Building and Facilities Committee, um, I've expressed last week some of my reasons for wanting to dissolve the Building and Facilities Committee. <clears throat> and I think the discussion that we have just had on the Solid Waste Committee and the Nancy's uh, nice comments earlier just just reinforce where where I'm coming from. Um, the the full building and facilities committee made a report to the board of selectmen in July of 2021, which was very comprehensive. And as somebody pointed out to me last week, I complimented the building and facilities committee on that work at the at the time or subsequently. That report was responded to by the town administrator in a lengthy document. And to my knowledge, now the all of the items that were on that agenda, other than those related to Whipple Hall, um, have been on the plate of the various department heads to consider. And I believe that after that report was completed, that for all intents and purposes, the um, Building and Facilities Committee has focused its intention and, uh, attention entirely on the Whipple Hall issues and more recently on the police site issues. In fact, I cannot find on the town records any meeting of any consequence, uh, subcommittee or otherwise, that has taken any action since July of 2021 on the issues that were in that report. I can see all sorts of information about um, issues that um, the town administrator has addressed around security, for example, in the academy building, but I don't see any further action that's took, taken place between the building and facilities committee and the, the selectmen or the rest of the town. So from my sense is that in reality, the building and facilities committee has since July of 2021, um, with a couple of exceptions, uh, been totally focused on Wh Whipple Hall and on the police. And I think each of those two activities are excellent examples of where small focused groups have had with time sensitive um, barriers or boundaries put around them have worked very effectively. The problem I've had with them is that they keep reporting back to this parent group instead of reporting to the Board of Selectmen. I personally would like to have had, before I was a selectman, heard the building facilities, I mean, the uh, Whipple Hall Committee and the police committee reporting directly to the Board of Selectmen. So I continue to think that there's two excellent examples of small focused groups that have uh, provided good service to the town, but which should be reporting directly to the selectmen and not back to another body of people that start that ask more questions about their work. If those other people, all well-meaning, have questions about what the subcommittee work is, come to a Board of Selectmen meeting. We're here, these are issues that we ought to be addressing, not waiting for them to have been uh, dealt with more and more, more meetings. So therefore, I would, I will, I'm going to move that we dissolve the current Building and Facilities Committee as a permanent committee, and having accomplished the task of identifying facilities-related issues in its July 2021 report to the Selectmen. I further am going to move that we reconstitute the Whipple Hall subcommittee as it now exists as an ad hoc group to continue to advise on and monitor Whipple Hall matters through at least 2023. And I would 
say that I, I think that Phil Sherman and Rip Cross and Colin Beasley should continue to be part of that effort as they are the subcommittee today. And again, as with the previous motion, I only mentioned those names to give some flavor to um, how I think that work would be carried out. So the motion is to dissolve the Building and Facilities Committee as a permanent committee and to uh, have its work be continued where appropriate with the selectmen put together advisory groups such as the Whipple Hall group or the police site uh, group. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Um, I'll second that. Any discussion? I, I would like to make a... Okay. Okay. Um, there have been numerous forums held to determine the desires of the New London community. Clearly, based on those forums and the master plan, New London residents want a new site and facility for the police department. I'm going to paraphrase a thought by Representative Linda Tanner referencing the school votes in Croydon. Political discussion should represent the consent of the governed, not the power of the few. I would suggest that we substitute municipal decisions for political. My question to the members of the BFC is, do you believe you have been polite and truly interested in the opinion of department heads? Do you think you have treated department heads and our town administrator with respect? I have been present at public meetings where that is not the case. And I know our town administrator has and continues to be barraged with negative demanding emails. The level of stress our employees are under due to the BFC committee is unprecedented. If a committee formed by the selectmen is not working the way the selectmen require by not presenting itself in a respectful, collaborative way, that reflects poorly on the selectmen. All committees represent the selectmen. And when I am embarrassed by the conduct of my representatives, I know it is time to make a change. I ask the members of the BFC to consider how they have spoken to the women's staff of the town of New London. Has it been respectful or has it been dismissive and patronizing? The town of New London has an amazing, incredibly competent staff. I don't want to lose them. In conclusion, I agree with Bob Bowers referencing his 515 email to thank the BFC and the selectmen will handle it from here. I also agree with Nancy that we should dissolve the BFC effective July 1st. So Janet, you have skipped a beat so that people will understand. There was an email that can be made available under right to know. Um, that was between uh, Kim, uh, Bill Helm, and Janet, where Bill was suggesting that he was and going you. to come and forward. You. And you. And myself, yeah. yes. Well, I wouldn't be able to speak to it if I wasn't included. Um, where Mr. Helm uh, had revised his proposal that he was bringing to the table tonight. At that point, my response to that was, should there be a vote to dissolve the BFC, then I would at least request, which is what my statement would be next anyways, that there needs to be a transition period, a reasonable transition period with the activities that they have been conducting of late and that the transition be at least to July 1st, which is what Janet has already preempted. Set that aside for a moment. Um, I want to state that again, I know of one circumstance that took place that was brought um, forward by Kim to the Board of Selectmen. I don't recall at any other time from either staff or from the town administrator concerns about the conduct of the Building and Facilities Committee coming to the Board of Selectmen. So I think this is unfair to be making these comments but so be it at this point. Um, I'm gonna open it up to discussion to um, the group. If there are any questions or comments that you would like to make. I think Kim should comment though on the, the state of um, 
working I with the building think, and facilities over the last year. She's the one who has had to do this as well as other uh, members of our staff. So I'm going to say at this point, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should suspend that line of discussion. I think that in all fairness, if things have not been brought forward in a timely manner, this is not the way to do it. This is only going to continue to be divisive and not achieve what it is that we're trying to do as a town together. So, are there any comments that would like to be made? Peter? Well, I'm gonna strongly disagree with Janet's thoughts and ideas that the Building and Facilities Committee has been disrespectful, has been non-responsive to department chairmans. They have made every effort to get everybody who had a, had a, had a stake in the issue at meetings. I have never seen anybody belittled or insulted whatever she's, however Janet feels they were, it's just, and I have been on probably as many committees as anybody sitting on the front table, and I cannot believe that these statements were made about half a dozen people who worked their butt off to get the job done. In my opinion, a 100% straightforward and respectful to everybody in the town, town department heads and the town employees. I am, could not be more upset with the slander that I think I've heard a few minutes ago. Thank you. Okay, um, Bob. Hi, Bob Bowers. Um, I, I did write a letter to the selectmen and Janet referred to it where I made a uh, suggestion that we put behind us all the all the uh, dissension that we've been experiencing and I, I hoped we could and I still hope we can and work together as a group. My first suggestion which Janet has uh, alluded to was that the selectmen who have the power to decide on the uh, police station issue um, and have been both Bill and Janet have expressed concerns that somehow this has been delayed by the BFC and others, that they exercise the power that they have and have always had, which is to basically thank the uh, BFC and especially the subcommittee for its work, ask for the report that the subcommittee submitted and take unto themselves the duty and obligation of looking at that issue of a new police station uh, to make whatever determinations need to be made and then to bring forward in the March meeting a warrant article asking for bond funding for land and for the cost of construction for a new police station. That, uh, they've always had that power. They could have, they could have done that from 2016 forward. Uh, do it now, do it, let's have it. Let's have a town meeting where it's decided. And let's find out if indeed everyone does want that and votes for the money necessary to do that. If they vote yes in the appropriate proportions, we can move forward and do that. If they vote no, I hope those who uh, advocate for a new police station will accept that vote just as anyone else would accept the other vote. And that we can all move together and look for solutions to problems that need to be attended to. What Janet didn't allude to is the second part of my suggestion, which was we keep the building and facilities committee in place. They have in effect come up with a number of issues which amount to an ad hoc uh, analysis of individual concerns that should be addressed. And that the selectmen take each of those, address them with the building committee's input since they have put a lot of time in on it and that they actually make decisions. Uh, one of the concerns I have had and people who have spoken to me have had is uh, the selectmen need to make decisions. It's one thing for the building committee to point out a number of things that they believe need to be attended to. And it's uh, another thing to actually do something about them. And then again, falls to the selectmen. I would suggest that 
we take those proposals that the building committee has brought, the selectmen have a meeting on each of those proposals. The selectmen determine the costs and problems involved and vote to go forward to take care of each of those issues. Now, now, they've been kicked down the can. A lot of those issues have been postponed and postponed. It's one thing to say, yes, the building committee has identified these and now we're done. And it's another thing to actually do something. And I think that you need the input of everybody on the building committee that participated in that in meetings with the selectmen on a one-on-one -on -one basis for an issue and not with an entire new schedule following it. Devote a session to an issue, resolve it, vote on it, recommend the budget needs to take care of it and move forward with dealing with what needs to be done. Thank you, you, Bob. I'm going to interrupt you only in that the discussion is with regards to the vote that is or the proposal that is on the table. Um, okay. Thank you. Yes. So I can't, I have to uh, make some comments, Bob and Peter, about what you've just said. Um, I have not been part of the uh, inner workings of the town for the last three years, but I, as a citizen, have, have observed some of the things that uh, Janet stated, and I do not believe it's appropriate or respectful to simply uh, re rehash the issues here tonight. But I think what Janet has said is based on a lot of fairly significant, significant events that have, have gone on. So that's first of all. Second of all, I believe that when the select, when I read the selectmen's minutes anyway, from last July, they received this long and well done report from the um, Building and Facilities Committee. And in fact, either by the, what they've asked the town administrator to do, because she is the one who carries out the work of the um, selectmen either directly or through the staff, that they have, uh, have acted because They've chosen that that wasn't a priority at this point. It, it's really significant to re recognize there's only so many things that we can all do in any one period of time. So we have to prioritize. We have to set um, a, a, a set of standards about what we are and are not going to do. We can't be off having um, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I use the uh, analogy last week of a, of a buffet. We can't have an all-you-can-eat buffet here. We're going to have to say there are these things we can do. And I believe that the select the old, the old former Board of Selectmen, through their act actions, chose to continue to work on the Whipple Hall project. And then in uh, November or December, the police site issue. I think the all the other things that were on that comprehensive report are apparently things that the Board of Selectmen chose not to pursue for the time being, which is fine. And if at some point, uh, Kim or somebody or one of the department heads wants to say, yes, I think we do need to address issue X, Y, or Z that was on that list, it should be brought to the Board of Selectmen. And I think the Board of Selectmen will in a future meeting here, uh, share with our, each, each of us will share with the others what we think are the priorities at this point, both in terms of the use of the staff time and in terms of fiscal uh, uh, ability to handle all of these different projects that are out there. Third of all, um, uh, I don't wanna go back to the whole history of the Stallman building, but uh, Bob, the purpose of that Stallman uh, proposal, you may recall, was to have a town meeting discussion and vote on the issue of the police station may not have liked the place that was being chosen there, but that was the purpose of that particular petition article, to have a town meeting vote. Turned out we didn't. Thank you. Joe Kubit. I've got the mic over oh, here. I'm so sorry, I didn't see you over there, Rob. <laughs> I was just gonna, I mean, I guess I'm really surprised that with all these issues that have been brought up that uh, they haven't been resolved. They haven't been brought forward. The parties haven't gotten together. They haven't had discussions. And by taking a vote now, uh, it'll just be pushed under the rug and bad feelings will exist. Uh, 
-hmm. you know, my test that, that uh, I have is that when you have a motion like this, ask yourself, is this going to help build unity? Will it increase discussion? Will we come together? Or is it going to be divisive? So ask yourself, is this going to be divisive, this proposal? Or will it bring people together, sort out some of the issues they've had in the past, and move forward as a team? John, Joe Kubit has his hand up first, and then it'll come to John. Uh, my name's Joe Kubit. For people who don't know who I am, I have kind of a simple question for the select board regarding this issue. In your minds, what is the purpose of the Building Facilities Committee? Is it supposed to tackle the task and get your report back? Or is it a wide open committee that can go to anything they want to do in terms of what they do with their time? So it's a question, are they focused or an unfocused situation? You probably Bill, all have three The Building and responses. Facilities Committee has had a charter um, that was developed by them at the request of the Board of Selectmen. They have focused on um, looking at all of the facilities and coming up with a facilities plan. Um, they've been working on um, digitizing or electronically having a report relative to how we will manage those buildings going forward. Um, there's a number of tasks that they've been assigned um, and you know we could go on and on. So it's not something that we were just been shooting from the hit, if you will. Well, John Wilson had his hand up first. Sorry, but you'll get your Fitbit points in. <laughs> oh, uh, sure. I was not on the uh, board of selectmen when the building and facilities committee was formed, and I would not have formed it at the time. Um, I guess my understanding was initially that it would be to look at different buildings and decide whether or not. Um, there were issues with those buildings that needed to be attended to, like a new roof or um, a sill that needed to be replaced, that sort of thing. But um, it turned out that more um, time was spent on a variety of issues that really didn't have anything to do with what I just said. So I guess I was um, disappointed and frustrated that that was not taking place. For example, um, I believe Chief Lyon said that they needed a new roof on the fire department. Well, I don't think we heard that from the Building and Facilities Committee. We heard it from Chief Lyon. So, um, but I did find out that when we recommended putting emergency management offices in Bucher, um, that they were so opposed to it that that um, did not happen. We did not, we do not have an office. For, uh, what? The Building and Facilities Committee. So uh, I don't think that was part of their charter, but that's what happened because they were opposed to our moving emergency management in Bucher. So I guess my thought is it didn't evolve or uh, it didn't happen the way that I, I thought it would. John. Well, uh, to be frank, I see this as a political ploy. Uh, I don't think you should dissolve this committee. I think it has some of the finest uh, and most talented and considered group of people we ever had on a town committee. Uh, I've been on town government long enough to see what happened to the academy building because it, uh, the uh, public works director was put in charge of maintaining uh, that building and uh, turn it into a $350,000, tear it apart, re-insulate it. We saw the uh, bandstand rot to the ground. We saw the problems in Whittle, Whipple Hall. We see the problems that were in Bucher Hall. Uh, how many thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars have we put into the library? We have been remiss over the years in keeping up with the, the properties that we have here in town. We finally have a group that's in, that has researched all this stuff. They now have institutional memory history in all of the in all these buildings, and hopefully we can maintain them now for a change instead of having to uh, fight the rot. Thank you. Uh, 
just a point of clarification, John, I think that you were referring to the former uh, head of public works. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, Bob, yes. he's great. <laughs> I just want to point out that it was Richard Lee, um, and if he was here right now, he would probably jump out of his seat um, to hear that, because when I first arrived here, he brought me to the bandstand and showed me the rot. He showed me the shingles and the siding on the academy building and how terrible it was. And my recollection at that time was it wasn't a matter of Richard not advocating or trying to fix those things. It was more a matter of the governing body and the budget committee who felt that the funds couldn't be put to the use. So I appreciate what you're saying, John, but I have to stick up for Richard Lee, who lit okay, who who did bring me to those two locations my very first week. And I actually picked up a piece of lattice that was from the bandstand that was on the green. So it wasn't rich that Richard Lee did not know about those deficiencies. It was that the town government felt they didn't want to put the funds to it at that time. On the academy building, uh, that some paint on the gutters of Whipple Hall was the first thing that we needed to do to take care of that problem. Uh, we have here a talented group and they've looked into this stuff and for the first time ever you feel good that perhaps the plant is under control here and uh you know look what we've done with buker hall and improve that and so forth i i think we're just because of political reasons we're throwing out something that's really good okay yes, yes. I want to remind people that in my uh, uh, proposals here so far, I've named four of the six members of the Building and Facilities Committee as people who I would uh, ask the selectmen to include in future ad hoc groups. There's probably roles for the other two that I have not mentioned yet, but those don't happen to be solid waste management or Whipple Hall. So my proposals do not throw out the talent that we're talking about. In fact, I have said over and over again that I think that the Whipple Group has done an outstanding job in what it's done through first two phases of that project. I disagree, as you all know, with some of the issues in the third phase, but we'll get to that because it's going to be brought forward step by step. So we're not getting rid of these people. We're using the, this talent in the, another way, John. We're not getting rid of the um, people in any way, shape, or form. Colin? Uh, Colin Beasley. So I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but I can't help myself. Um, I, I would request that the select board, when referring to the work that was underway and has been completed by the BFC, that we talk with the facts. Uh, with respect, Janet, the facts that you cited on the chief line roof issue uh, and the emergency management shift to Buker are not accurate. Um, so, and I'm not going to get into why they're not accurate. There's all kinds of details that I would ask you to read through. And if you want to meet with us, we'd be happy to review with you. But I think that if the select board is going to talk about and use examples, please, please be accurate. Okay. And I only ask that you do the same. Okay. So, uh, with respect to the charter, uh, I'm sorry, what, what our task was, it was defined in the charter and, uh, two of the three selectmen that are here tonight approved that charter. So uh, what we did was what you asked us to do. So if you're surprised by what we didn't do, it's because you didn't ask us to do it. We did what you asked us to do. Okay. And with respect to the organizational design principles, Bill, I would ask that you think through, though I guess at this point, maybe you have and you're, you've concluded it. Uh, when you have a core set of uh, experts looking at multiple common issues, you can accomplish a lot. And I respectfully disagree with an agenda of the select board to work on two or three things. Organizational design principles would allow you to leverage committees to accomplish a lot of things. And by delegating that work out 
and having them do the work with the appropriate staff of the town, you can accomplish a lot as opposed to accomplishing two or three things. And, and I won't speak anymore. Thank you. Okay. And back here. Um, I'm Barry Wright from Elkins, and I I uh, have attended the last I guess the last three meetings of the uh, uh, BFC, and I am impressed by not only the individuals on it and and their knowledge and what they bring to the uh, the, the strength they have, but. They're also looking at these issues in a very structured manner. And I think that is just invaluable. We need to, we need to look at, at the big picture, which they do. And they have the time, well, they have the energy to do that. And I would, I, I, I think you would be making a, a, a very, very wrong decision if you throw that structure out. I, and you can call them ad hoc, that doesn't matter. It's, it's more impressive than looking at the group up front. You know, they're doing, they're answering questions. <laughs> they're, uh, okay. they're looking at, they're, they're a good group and well-formed and hard working. Joe. Thanks, Will. Uh, Joe Cardillo. Um, first of all, I apologize for the late arrival. Uh, and I'll, I'm gonna apologize up front because I don't know what was spoken about before I got here. Some of it might be repeated. I know there's a motion on the floor apparently to disband the Building and Facilities Committee, um, which I think would be a huge mistake. I was um, fortunate enough to be asked to be on that committee as a budget committee representative. Um, I frankly could care less if a budget committee representative had a vote on that committee or not. Um, again, I'm gonna apologize. I know there was a whole laundry list that Bill had come in with of governance changes. I read through all the documents uh, on the website today, and there was not a single document in support of his efforts. Um, so it, that's a little, uh, I hope you take that into consideration as you're making your decision on just this building and facilities committee. Um, I've been on the budget committee for 12 years, and um, I've worked with a lot of talented people in this community. On, on a number of different committees. Um, my experience on the Building and Facilities Committee by far was the most involved, engaged, and talented group I had ever worked with. They had done everything the selectmen had asked them to do. Um, when you asked us to look uh, at a specific project, a specific building, uh, we did it. If they weren't acted upon, it's because it stalled in a selectman's office. It wasn't because of the Building and Facilities Committee. Um, unfortunately, I heard some comments last week uh, from people as we were exiting that suggested, gee, we've been trying to get a police station for since 2018. What is wrong with the Building and Facilities Committee? Um, why are we not getting it? This effort to disband BFC does feel political and it feels like there's gonna be some unforeseen consequences if it goes that route. And what I mean by that is some of this is political and we make choices, but the choices are not the building and facilities committee's choices. They're not the BFC choices. And frankly, they're not the selectmen's choices. The ultimate decision makers are the voters. And when the voters are not given the proper information and complete and thorough analysis of what's going on, it stalls the process. Let me give you for example, what just came to light through, his, through some history. In a closed 
non-public session some years ago, the Board of Selectmen discussed a parcel of land, which frankly is in front of the Building and Facilities Committee right now. Those minutes were just released some four years later. And I believe, I could be, correct me if I'm wrong, it actually might be this current group that had the conversation about the so-called Bewley land. Well, they did some studies on that land, which frankly is in the hunt for a new police station, and then chose to come to the town and ask for $500,000 to buy a site that was unidentified and there was no specific reason on why they would buy it. And they met a ton of resistance and it was voted down. To me, the problem was the way it was put forward to the voters. If you want to accomplish something, you've got to choose your path fairly, carefully, and diligently. Uh, I was um, fortunate enough to have an old friend from Newberry join us on our Building and Facilities Committee that added a voice, Nancy Maraccio, of reason to the committee that said, listen, we need, if we're going to get this through to the voters, to explain why we're choosing these sites, but what do we do going forward with the Buker building? How are we gonna get this to happen? So our methods have been flawed in the past on how we've put this in front of the voters. It was almost like ready, fire, aim. The Building and Facilities Committee has done a thorough job on putting this forward. Um, you know, frankly, we've been stalled and slowed down by some efforts uh, again, in a closed door, non-public session by a board of selectmen, not telling us what piece of land they were working about. And then one of the selectmen on our, sitting on our building facilities committee knew that an appraisal existed on this parcel of land. And in fact, intervened and called the owners of that land while we were working on a site and indicated to the owners of that land that this isn't exactly what the town wants. The town wants uh, a, a larger parcel, the entire Bewley land. Excuse me, Madam Chairman, but would you please uh, call the uh, motion? Uh, Mr. Cardillo is uh, offending me with some of his comments at this point. I, I apologize if, 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 if you're feeling there's some offense, I'm just stating the facts. Uh, as Mr. Beasley said, if you wanna state the facts, that's fine, but I do not think this is the forum for us to have a personal discussion. So let me, let me just- you, you are, You're making comments about me, Joe, which are not fair, but I'm not going to argue with you about the facts in front of this group of people, but this, it is offensive that you are challenging my uh, integrity at this point. Thank you. I, the facts are, are what's in the minutes so, of every town meeting. You can, you can find what happened um, in the closed non-public session. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up by saying that this is the best chance, this building and facilities committee has given the town the best chance to really decide for themselves on a site that's been now presented to the selectmen, some choices, and the ability to have a police station. You know, so I see two things here. It's politically motivated to get rid of the building facilities committee. And then the number one agenda is let's get a new police station. So the choice is in front of the board on, on what will happen with the BFC. But I think it would be, um, uh, unfortunate for the voters of this town to see this talented group of people dismantled. Do you want to speak? Okay. Nancy? Thank you, Nancy Maraccio. You are considering setting a precedent, which to me is very dangerous. And that is that you're making decisions without doing assessment. Assessment is usually done by looking at the standards and putting the work against the standards in an objective way. It also includes self-assessment by whatever group is being assessed. I haven't seen either of those two processes. If you do it tonight, what happens the next time there's a question? 
So I beg you to include assessment in any such decision. Are you speaking or? Uh. Isn't it possible that we can, you can table this the way you did one through three or four? Why does it have to be decided now? I mean, I, I just, I think it, it requires a little more thought as you so rightfully pointed out, Nancy. I mean, what, what happens if you just go to this committee and ask for, basically what Bill is asking for. Which is the statement I had made when Correct. I had recommended that we have a compromise on the matter. Correct. At the compromise seems to be the thing that should be voted on, not the actual bullet point of removing and dissolving. Janet Haynes, um, Highland Ridge. I don't know your first name. You, Rob, Rob, Rob Prohl. Um, his words are ringing in my ear. Um, I've had about enough of the rancor. I have read all of those letters that Kim made available. Um, and, and it turns my stomach, frankly. Um, there was vitriol, there was rancor, and you know who I'm talking about. I don't, it's, it's unacceptable behavior, but I do know that that is not going to go away. It is only going to intensify if we go through with this vote tonight because there is too much misunderstanding, I believe, of what Bill Helm is trying to do and what Nancy is trying to suggest. I do believe that with cooler heads that aren't present right now, we can come to an accommodation and I would respectfully ask that, as you have suggested, this gets tabled for tonight. There's too much not good stuff that's floating around. And I don't want that to impact what ultimately, what good potentially can come of this. Thank you. So I'll turn to my colleagues. Um, I, I guess I would say that I am not um, agreeing with Bill because I have any animosity toward any of the members of the Building and Facilities Committee. There are several of whom I have worked very closely with in the past and we have a good relationship. Um, but I am troubled about the way they have conducted themselves with town staff. And I honestly feel that some of the members of our staff will not remain if they're going to have to deal with some of the people going forward. I think um, Kim is maybe close to the breaking point with some of the things she's had to, um, she's had to make sure that our employees are uh, kept off the ledge and that she should be able to have a weekend without four or five emails accusing her of not responding or not dealing with a matter that they feel is important. I don't think we need four or five page uh, emails expressing opinions. And, and I mean, at, at what point do you really want to go forward in your life having to deal with people like that. I think, I think some of the members of the Building and Facilities Committee are angry, and I think the way they have um, dealt with town employees, and again, I'm gonna say especially the women, that it has troubled me, and I feel that I need to act. 
I also need to act because people say to me, they are not here tonight, maybe some of them are, but why are you letting this committee run the town? You were elected, they were not. So I guess that my that would be my response. It's not because I don't like people and I wanna get rid of the committee and I really feel like they have done some very good things, but I also think that it has slowed down some of the actions the selectmen would take. And I know for the last three years, when I have made a suggestion or wanted to do something that I was always in the minority, I was the minority vote. And that's fine, I mean, that's, that's government. But I do think now we need to reconstitute our committees or our panels or ad hoc groups, however you want to term it, and put people on it that will work collaboratively and not come in yelling at our town administrator or other department heads. I think that has to end. I really do. I don't disagree that that should end. It should, but it it just smacks of then you need to lead them as to what your expectation is. This goes back to what Nancy said. If you're aware that this is what's happening, you need to nip it in the bud. I'm sorry. Suddenly, this is going to be this acute decision tonight. It, it and in, I agree with the whole divisive stuff. You guys need to be in charge of the committees and what they are supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be behaving. And if they're not doing it, you got to step up and make that happen. Now, all of a sudden, it's all it's all of us that are going to know about this and you're going to make this decision tonight. I, you need to like talk to people, as Nancy suggested, on these committees and tell them what you expect from them, tell them what you don't like about what's going on. But here we are discussing all this, and I'm sure there are residents out there still saying, yep, when is that police station happening? We're not, we're not getting to that. So some stuff just has to get done with the rest of us, not necessarily knowing, but trusting, because we voted for you, that you're gonna be able to manage the expectations and the behavior that you have for governing this town? No, um, my, my turn, I guess. I um, want to go back again and start where we were 45 minutes ago or so and say that I have listened very carefully over an extended period of time dating back into 2021 before I was a selectman to various views about what shouldn't shouldn't be done in the town. It caused me this winter to decide to run again to be a selectman, even though I thought after my first term that I'd done, done enough for the town, but I was persuaded that there was a strong desire on the part of a majority of the voters of this town to have some changes take place. So this is not a new discussion. The compromises that I've put forth tonight from my original positions are extensive in terms of eliminating three of the five points that I initially made. I've also made it very clear in terms of naming names tonight that I would include, if my colleagues agree, the members of the Budget and Facilities Committee in the places where they can work directly with the Board of Selectmen on specific issues, but not as a group above a group of people who are then Put, creating another layer of management or activity in the town. I feel strongly that we have talked about this for months, if not years, and it is time now to decide what we're going to do to have effective government in this town. As for the police issue, that's gonna be the next motion once we get through this one. But um, uh, I have, I, I've been very clear that I believe that the work of the Building and Facilities Committee has now focused on two topics, Whipple Hall, which I believe should be continued until the Whipple Hall project is ended, hopefully in the summer of 2023 now, we're told, and the police site issue. It's not build a new police station, it's identify a site where we might build a new police station after lots and lots of additional steps are taken. 
So I think it's time to call the question and and uh, and put this issue behind us and move on to actually things that produce activity for the town. Does Janet want to say something? <laughs> Respectfully, it, Mr. Helm, this is Hayes. Would you consider amending your um, motion? Oh. I guess it is to instead of dissolving to reconstituting the Building and Facilities Committee in such a way as to address very specific topics that are in front of the town. Thank you, Jan. That's, uh, that's the essence of what I've done here. And perhaps uh, somebody would like to suggest the, the wording instead. My original motion. Excuse me, Bill. I'm so sorry. But, <laughs> oh, I can't. I'm sorry. What? No, let, let me just answer, uh, Janet, though. Uh, what I proposed additionally, and maybe you don't like the word dissolved, was that we dissolve the Building and Facilities Committee as a permanent committee and reconstitute the Whipple Hall subcommittee to continue to advise on Whipple Hall. So that is the issue that is now left. And if, if uh, it makes it sound better to say, reconstitute the Building and Facilities Committee as the Whipple Hall Committee, reporting directly to the selectmen, that's fine. That was, that's, that's the essence of what my proposal was. And uh, I'm perfectly happy if it if the language is, doesn't suit people to have the Building and Facilities Committee be redirected to be the Whipple Hall uh, Committee, uh, uh, Ripple Hall Renovation Committee. But that is the only assignment that the Building and Facilities Committee would then have under my proposal. Call it what you want. It, it's still going to be the same thing. And rejects the remaining activities that they're involved with. No, it, uh, it you've suggested the, the date of um, um, July first to uh, continue to sort out anything else that's that's there. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the July twenty first, two thousand twenty one report uh, listed all the other items that needed to be dealt with, and for whatever reason. They haven't, the town has chosen not to proceed with them or has proceeded with them and their uh, completed um, issues. As you know, I'm about to deal with at the issue of the police site subcommittee, but um, we haven't gotten to that yet tonight. But at the end of the day, my belief is that of the activities that have been ongoing with the building and facilities committee, that the remaining activity for which I would be supportive is the Whipple Hall renovation work. And so we can word it any way you want. I don't know who you're pointing to. Oh. What I'm hearing from the people who are sitting in front of me, I think it makes great sense that I, I guess there's a motion on the floor. I came in late to dissolve the BFC. To me, it sounds like you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. To reconstitute the BFC, seat the people you want on there, uh, maybe the way to move forward. Um, that's all I've got to say. I, I think disbanding the BFC uh, throws a lot of good work out the window. So I don't know. You probably have been listening to the tape. You're listening to the report broadcast. You probably don't have it written down exactly, Katrina. So let, let me try again. Dissolve the current Building and Facilities Committee as a permanent committee it having accomplished the task of identifying facilities related issues in its July 2021 report to the selectmen and reconstitute the Whipple Hall subcommittee 
as an ad hoc group to continue to advise the selectmen on and monitor Whipple Hall matters through 2023. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> There are two motions on the floor. You had the original motion. That's the original motion. That was the original motion. Excuse me, I'm reading here. That's exactly what I just read. We can roll the tape back. Hang on, Trina's going to listen to the tape. He did have it in there. Okay. 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 Thanks, Trina. Okay. So um, we have the motion. It's been seconded. Um, we have had discussion. Um, so I will call for a roll vote. Janet? Yes. Bill? Yes. Nancy? Unequivocally, no, I think this is the wrong thing for the town of New London. Unfortunately, the vote carries. Maybe. I would like to say something before we move on. I want to publicly thank the members of the Building and Facilities Committee, Colin Beasley, Bob Bowers, Joe Cardillo, Rip Cross, Phil Sherman, Peter Hoagland, and Nancy Maraccio for all of the time and effort and work that you have provided to the town of New London. Um, I thank you. Um, I would also ask that there be a transition period. Hopefully those members will agree to a transition period of activities that are um, open and ongoing. Um, I would also ask that be effective July 1st, this vote. Um, and I will charge Mr. Helms with the creation of these ad hoc committees um, and coming up with a strategy as to how that is going to be implemented and worked. Um, Thank you. I'll be happy to take that, that on. I'm may sure. I go, may I go to my last motion? You may. Okay. I move that the, that the Board of Selectmen ask the Police Site Subcommittee to present its March 22, 2022 report to the Board of Selectmen at its June 9th meeting, at which time the Selectmen may begin to determine the next steps related to the future location of the Police Department. Which, by the way, was the plan of the Building and Facilities Committee to come forward with it at that point in time anyways. So. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Three ayes? Yes, I said aye. aye. <clears throat> so thus concludes our governance discussion. I'll ask for the town administrator's report. Hey, um, the, I have sent the attorney, uh, town council, the lease and the bond for the fire truck uh, that we're going to enter into. He was quite pleased with both the bond and the contract that was entered into by the fire department for that purchase, lease purchase. An update on the AV for Whipple. Um, our AV people, we have some equipment that's back ordered until June. And then we have other equipment that is back ordered until October. He is trying desperately to find other options for those that equipment so that we can have the mics uh, and the audio set up. So that's ongoing. As a reminder, next week we have the fireworks ordinance public, not next week, the 26th next meeting. Is that next week? Next yeah. week. Okay, next week. Okay, yes, next sorry. Week. Um, May 26th, we will have the fireworks ordinance public hearing, the fire chief, police chief, and I have worked out some proposed ordinances, should you decide to do something, and I will post those and also send them to the selectmen. 
Finally, we have a um, municipal work zone agreement from the Department of Transportation they would like you to, the board to agree to. Uh, what it is, it's an acknowledgement that the DOT has the authority to control traffic in the work zone um, of the park and ride project. So I'd recommend you sign that. It's a routine thing. Anytime they do projects like that, they ask towns to acknowledge that they can do that. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee meetings and reports. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank Kim for the municipal matters, especially with regard to um, trash. I thought the pictures were quite helpful. <laughs> Wait, I'll, I'll let Nancy Bartho, she worked hard on that. Yeah, it was really, really well done. Um, the planning board met on May 10th. And the first item was um, meeting with Eversource regarding the poles they want to replace on Whitney Brook Road, 40 Acres Road, County Road, Denites Hill. And they're doing uh, trimming and uh, they may remove some trees. Uh, so that was an informational thing for us and we were fine with that. Also, Colby Sawyer College came with regard to their field house and their proposal was approved and it was noted that um, the parking lot will not be paved, it will be a gravel parking lot, and there will be no lights on the building, um, on this building. So that was approved. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we, we got a preliminary uh, public hearing on um, the yellow building right across from the barn playhouse. I think you, I, I don't know if I, 13 Pressy Court, I don't know whether that's you know where that is. But anyway, it's right across from uh, the Barn Playhouse. The people who have bought that building, they removed the trees. So maybe that makes it more familiar. Anyway, they are going to um, rehabilitate and uh, fix up that whole um, complex. It has five units. And um, so they will come back with a plan. Uh, they just wanted to know what our thoughts were on that. And of course, we were in favor of it. There's some issues with regard to the parking um, that it goes with that building. So they'll try to um, figure that out and come back for a, uh, a regular, um, instead of a preliminary, um, a regular plan. And, um, oh, and there was um, a final site plan review for uh, Spring Ledge Farm. Uh, Greg is putting in uh, solar mounted, um, units on his roof and also adding a um, land, uh, installing a, um, a ground mounted system. In addition, he is um, going to have a, um, what do you call it? A wood chip boiler that will, um, the whole thing, this whole process is quite expensive. Nevertheless, it's gonna save them a great deal of money on their electricity. Um, you will not be able to see the solar arrays. Possibly you might be able to see the ones on top of his roof, but the others will be behind his building way in the back on his property. And with regard to the wood chip boiler, um, it's gonna be uh, housed in a uh, small building. So that's it from the planning board. Okay. Uh, approval of the selectmen's minutes of April 28th. So Jim. moved. Second. Um, Bill, you have to abstain. You weren't here. Oh, sorry. I won't, I won't move it. So Janet. I move that we accept those minutes. Okay, and I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And Janet, I assume you're in favor? Yes. Yeah, I said yes. Okay, I'm not going to go through a litany of upcoming meetings and special events. We've been here long enough. Um, and I don't believe there's any other business to come before the board this evening. So we'll move into approving pay vouchers and permits. Um, and then we will be closing the meeting. I heard something at a, um, an HMA workshop that says Robert's rules of order say you don't have to abstain even if you're not at a meeting. That was a little tidbit I learned. So yeah, I, I was going to look it up, but 
I'm not a fan of Robert's rules, but I was quite surprised at that little tidbit. So I have just, never heard of such a thing where you either. would approve a rule, uh, something well, that you've I guess, not been I guess, present at. And I, if I had to guess, I would say that the person who's not there is approving that that's what, that's what, the, that's what the action of the board is. That's the only thing that you're actually approving. Right. Anyway, a little tidbit. Mm.